Hi there. In this video, we're going to talk about how we actually go about testing for heteroscedasticity. And the test which we're going to talk about in this video is something which is called the Goldfeld quant test. And it's probably the most simple of um, tests for heteroscedasticity, but it's actually quite a nice one because it's got quite a nice intuitive interpretation. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves what we're testing for. So the idea is that there is some sort of population and within that population, there is some sort of population process where sort of y is equal to alpha plus beta one x one, um, sort of all the way through to let's say um, plus beta p times x p plus some population error u. And what we're testing in these particular tests is we're testing that the variance of um, u is equal to a constant. That's the assumption of homoscedasticity or homoscedastic errors, which say that the variance of my um, errors or population errors are independent of my x variables. And this contrasts with the situation with heteroscedasticity because now we've got the sort of variance of um, u is equal to sigma squared times some sort of function of my sort of x variables, right? And it can be any of those x variables. In the Goldfeld quant test, what we're doing is we're testing for heteroscedasticity of errors, but in regard to only one of the particular regressors. So the idea is that if I had a plot of my sort of population errors squared, and I plotted that against one of my variables, which I suspected uh, might be causing heteroscedasticity, then if I had homoscedastic errors, I would sort of have something which looked perhaps like this, right? So the sort of deviation of my, um, or the sort of variance of u isn't noticeably increasing as um, my variable xk increases. But if I had heteroscedasticity, the idea is that I would get perhaps something which looks um, slightly different. So as my variable xk increases, I might expect that my um, u would increase. Right, and that's um, my u in the population, my population error. So notice here that as x is increasing, my sort of u squared is increasing, or my deviation of my um, sort of process from the mean is increasing. So I've got um, heteroscedasticity here in the population. So how do we go about testing for heteroscedasticity in the population, given that we've only got a sample, right? And we actually don't observe this u. We have to estimate it. Well, a sort of first guess at something which might be sensible to do would be to replace our population error by our estimated error. So just reminding ourselves what this estimated error means, it means that if I was to estimate a model by least squares and I sort of get these sort of hatted variables and um, just to differentiate them from the population parameters, then I will get some estimate of the population error, u, which we call residuals. And the idea is that um, it actually turns out that it's absolutely fine to replace our population error by our estimated error, um, at least asymptotically. That actually turns out to be an absolutely fine thing to do. It's still, it's, it's not exactly equivalent, but it's at least a um, sensible thing to do. So it does provide us some way of testing for heteroscedasticity in the population, given that we only observe sort of that which we estimate in our sample. So the idea behind the Goldfeld quant test is that if I took my residuals from my original regression and I plotted them along my, or sort of ordered them along my variable xk, and if I plotted them, then it might look something like this. If um, the variance of sigma, or the, sorry, the variance of my sort of error given my variable xk was, let's say, sigma squared times xk. So that's that's a function of xk, right? And it's a linear sort of increasing function of xk. So my variance of u has increased as xk has increased. So the idea behind the Goldfeld quant test is kind of a visual one, really. Um, and it's if I was to sort of divide my sample into two, so calling this the first region one, the second region two, then if I was to sort of add together all the sort of residual sum of squares in my sample two and compare that with that in my sample one after of course I've taken into account whether sample two has more observations than sample one 
then if there is some sort of particular difference between those two, then that's indicative of the fact that my um, population, or sorry, my sample error is increasing along with, it was increased in the second sample relative to the first sample. So the idea with the Golfer Quant test is that we compare the residual sum of squares in the second sample with the residual sum of squares in the first sample, after we've taken into account, of course, the fact that our second sample may have a differing number of observations to my first sample. And if the residual sum of squares is particularly different between the two, well, that's probably a sign that my um, variance of my error is actually different between the two samples. And another way for saying that is that we actually have heteroscelasticity. So how do we go about forming this statistic? Well, what we do is we take the residual sum of squares from the sort of second region. So that's the sum from i equals 1 to n2 of u hat um, squared for all the observations which are in the sort of second half of the sample. And then we divide that through by the residual sum of squares in our first half of the sample. So that's now from the sum of i equals 1 to n1 of u hat i squared. And then we need to make these things comparable. And um, so we need to divide the second half of the sample's residual sum of squares by the number of observations in that sample. And we take the first half of the, um, of the observations in our first half, and we divide that through by the number of observations in our first half. So now we make sure that we're basically comparing apples with apples, if you like. And the idea is if, if the sort of numerator is significantly different from the denominator, then that's probably a sign that I've got heteroscedasticity. And that's sort of shown because under the null hypothesis, the, um, this statistic is distributed uh, with a sort of F distribution with N2 degrees of freedom um, for the first input and N1 for the second input. And I should sort of mention that the null hypothesis of this test is that we actually have homoscholastic errors. So under the null hypothesis, these two things should be very close um, to one another. So the F um, distribution will, or the F statistic will be very close to one for this test. So if we're getting significant deviations away from one, then that's probably a sign that, that we've got heteroscedasticity in our model. And the reason I like the Goldfield quant test, even though it's not particularly powerful, it doesn't test for um, heteroscedasticity along many variables, is that it's a nice graphical test. And really, it, we could sort of do the test without actually even calculating the statistic, because if we were to take our estimated residuals from, or estimated errors from our regression and order them along our variable xk, and our sort of square our estimated residuals rather, then if there is some sort of systematic pattern, whether it be sort of increasing or decreasing or following any sort of nonlinear pattern, then that's probably a sign that we've got heteroscedasticity in our model. And in general, it's always a much better idea to use plots and graphs rather than just relying on statistics alone, because if you rely on statistics alone, the problem is you don't know why we might be, in this case, rejecting the null hypothesis of homoscedastic errors. So think about two particular examples. We might reject the null hypothesis of there being um, homoscedastic, homoscedastic errors if we had this sort of situation whereby I sort of had errors which look something like this along xk, but it just so happened that I had one outlier that was sort of up like that. Perhaps we would reject the null hypothesis of homoscedastic errors in this particular case, um, although this is really only due to one particular observation. And contrast this with the situation where we've got some sort of much more obvious heteroscedasticity, which looks something like this. Yeah, so this second case here is a much more obvious case than the sort of first one. And it, it's much more, it looks much more like we've got real heteroscedasticity rather than the first one. So um, just because we reject the null hypothesis of heteroscedasticity, we wouldn't be able to tell which of these two situations we were in. So that's the idea behind doing plots and, and, and doing sort of scatter plots, um, because it provides some insight into why a given test has, let's say, led us to reject the null hypothesis of homoscedastic errors.